Perfect. All right, our next speaker this morning is Paul Cunningham. Paul has been a fisheries ecologist for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources since 1993. Paul will be presenting on brook trout reserves, an adaptation strategy to deal with climate change. Go ahead and Paul, take it away. Well, thank, thank you, Paul Skowinski. Um, welcome everyone this morning. And Paul, you just muted yourself. Oh. There we go. Oh, my bad. Well, welcome everyone. And uh, thanks for the kind lead in, Brian Maitland. Um, we've had the fortunate pleasure of having Brian from the great Cowboy State come join our Bureau of Fisheries Management as a postdoc. And he's building, helping to build some of the future tools uh, for decision making in the realm of trout management here in the state. I'm going to talk about the tools we're currently using and uh, some of the management uh, choices we're uh, forwarding in, in the arena of um, trout management. So um, I want to acknowledge uh, my co-authors, uh, Joanna Griffin, Matt Mitro, and John Lyons. They've been working with us on the uh, brook trout reserves. And uh, as long, in addition to the members of the Brook Trout Reserves team. Uh, today, I'd like you to walk you through an example how we've begun to use these large databases and climate science modeling tools like uh, USGS FishViz to help us attempt to prioritize on the ground adaptation strategies um, for brook trout management. And because uh, brook trout, as Brian stated, uh, has a while we may be experiencing a Goldilocks period, as he termed it right now, um, they face some real sobering climate science, climate change challenges. And so this is a, this talk today is a really a case about modeling for future conditions using fish viz in our uh, cold water species brook trout. So what about brook trout? Um, Wisconsin's native brook trout are an integral part of our natural legacy, our culture and our identity. And they're very, as Brian said, they're very sensitive to changes in water temperature. And our global climate models indicate that climate change is really going to have a significant impact in the upper Midwest, the mid latitude regions of the US. And dealing with this um, climate change will require some of the best science we have and some really important, meaningful participation in, from our public and private stakeholders. So the uh, Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change impacts their cold water fisheries working group suggested we use a triage approach to identify and allocate our resources accordingly. And so that could include managing for brown trout, a little more thermally tolerant species rather than brook trout in some habitats. And uh, the second strategy would be to suggest to develop some adaptation uh, measures to focus on how we manage the land, the shoreline and water use and in-stream habitat work to try to offset the impacts of some of these rising air and water temperature and changes we're seeing in, in precipitation. The other side of this case is uh, of course the modeling, the fish viz and fish viz is a USGS sponsored model that projects current conditions and changes in our stream temperatures and fish distribution in, across all the Great Lakes region in response to climate change. Uh, this effort was led by USGS um, and involved the US Geological Survey researchers, the Wisconsin DNR, Michigan Institute for Fisheries Research and Michigan State University. And they, they collaborated, construct these models to assess the impacts of rising air temperatures and changes in precipitation on stream water temps and stream flows and their commensurate fish communities. So the models project future distributions for 14 species based on their known locations, their habitat preferences and their adaptability. Um, and the stream, species, the stream species model utilizes some models that John Lyons worked on and includes some stream temperature modeling components that were really got, we, the researchers really refined by the work of Janice Stewart, Steve Westenbrook and Matt Mitro. And this report is on, available online. I wanna step back a little and give you a little context. In, in 2013, as part of the Driftless Area Streams Master Plan, 
the project, um, it was an earlier version of precursor to fish fish. We were assessing uh, thermal conditions and trout occurrence in the driftless and looking at the thermal resilience of our streams across the driftless. And here I actually am showing uh, the changes in temperature um, from current to mid-century. And these are July means and the change, you won't see decreases, but the dark blues and blue colors represent the um, thermally most resilient streams that are projected to increase the least really in the situation. And then the, the red and pink streams are less resilient and these July mean stream, stream temperatures will increase more than two and a half degrees Fahrenheit um, by the mid-century. And not all streams are created equal. And so there is a significant uh, factor in the difference of the relative amounts of uh, you know, stream flow that's contributed by shallow groundwater, surface water, or deep groundwater. So these streams are behaving very differently. And here I show now the projected occurrence of brook trout in the mid-century where the red areas are catchments where brook trout are currently exist and will be will disappear. Uh, local extirpations are expected by the mid-century. And likewise, the catchments where brook trout are projected to be stable are shown in black. And in this environmental assessment we did, the department identified the need to pursue additional efforts with partners to remediate you know, the effects of climate warming on brook trout. And it was during this master plan process when we introduced the concept of brook trout reserves. Now, since then, um, we've examined the impact of climate change on brook trout as um, uh, Brian referenced uh, the work led by John Lines and Matt Mitro, we've looked at it statewide. And, and here we see brook trout face a, a statewide and, and even a regional crisis in terms of habitat losses. And these are pretty some sobering results and they, they point to the need for us to try and prioritize and select some adaptation strategies for brook trout. And so in the Northern Lakes and Forests, as you can see, we're expecting a 46% decline in future brook trout habitat by the mid-century. The North Central Hardwood Forest ecoregion um, and 75% decline um, and the same for the driftless and the Southeast uh, Wisconsin Till Plains and the Central Corn Belt Plains in the Southeast part of the state um, with the highest levels of impact of climate change. So when you see these sobering results, you know, our approach was to think about forming a team, of course, in the department. And we proposed a, we create an internal brook trout reserve teams. And first thing we did is said, well, what's a brook trout reserve? And we uh, attempted to define it. And we said, you know, and you can read it here, but it's a selection of places where, you know, we believe that brook trout have, based on our evidence, have the best chance of enduring the effects of climate change. And this, you know, the designation of these are, will be a rallying point for the department and all of our partners in, across the state to focus on their tools to try and keep them on the landscape. And I think these are the areas where it's not that we weren't, won't manage them elsewhere, but which we would prioritize protecting wild brook trout in their habitat. And to do this, we're, the, the goal here is to put everything on the table, you know, for consideration in order to achieve our goal of this conservation biology proposal. Um, and we put together this goal statement and this, this goal statement of establishing and managing the zoo reserves um, to support um, self resilient, self-sustaining populations um, was echoed in our 10-year fishery strategic state, statewide strategic plan in a, and as well in our recent trout plan um, that was approved by the Natural Resources Board. Um, so the team established four objectives and for this talk, I'm gonna describe our methods and progress towards accomplishing the first two objectives using relevant and objective criteria, identify and establish or nominate reserves that represent the best brook trout habitat populations and fisheries found in, in each of our four major ecoregions. 
And then for each reserve, identify and assess some of the existing and potential biological, environmental, and climactic threats that would lead into the um, strategic planning. So we used, um, we tried to pull together some of the best science we had uh, to develop and identify criteria and rank the brook trout reserve statewide. Um, the selection process uh, utilized model stream temperatures and brook trout occurrences from FishViz, the USGS model. Um, we used Fishtail, which is an index that uh, looks at characterizing stream fish response to urban and agricultural inputs um, in, land, in these land use conditions. We used our uh, statewide database on brook trout and brown trout catch per effort. Um, and we used information from 2007 through 2014 in our statewide uh, fisheries database. We used, um, we characterized uh, from our DNR managed lands, all of our fee title acquisition boundary, all of our public lands, um, as well, and um, our trout classification of our trout class. We have trout class one, two, and three trout waters. We used all that information. And then we pulled together um, our newest Wistland two from 2016 data to characterize land use and riparian primarily, looking more at riparian land use as well, conditions. So here, what I'm showing is our, how did we analyze our data, our basic spatial assessment unit for the brook trout reserves evaluation and selection process was um, really that neighborhood or what we would call as a sub watershed or HUC 12. The USGS system survey, geological survey created this um, hierarchical nested hierarchical system of hydrologic unit codes. And this is very similar to, it's spatially nested and it's very similar to our National Fish Habitat Monitoring Program. And so in the state of Wisconsin, we have 1800 and some sub watersheds of which we have um, 596 class one trout streams in them. And we assembled the data around these, um, Fa, fa, the following themes really, um, contemporary conditions of the streams and resilience to climate change, riparian and sub watershed land use quality, the degree of current protection and level of management opportunity, competition from non-native salmonids like brown trout and conservation genetics. So we essentially we, we use this, the, the team worked on the criteria and I, I worked on the analysis. And, and so we had the starting point of about 581, two sub watersheds. And then we started applying these filters or criteria in the selection of the final set of nominated reserves. So first thing we said is, you know, you gotta have some naturally reproducing trout water, some class one is our naturally reproducing trout water. Um, you need at least a, a tenth of a mile of it to even get you in the game. That, so that was our starting point of 582 sub watersheds. And then you need to have something in the future. And so the mid century projections from fish viz, we said you need um, at least two miles of future brook trout habitat. Um, that was a basic spatial minimum. And that took us down to 344 sub watersheds. Then we wanted uh, sub watersheds in the eco regions. And so we standardized by eco region um, brook trout that were either in the third or fourth quartile above the mean uh, for uh, in terms of uh, density. So these were uh, fairly our upper better brook trout populations in terms of density. Or if we had no data that the brook trout occurrence miles in currently was at least as much, if not greater than trout class miles. So that took us down to 214 sub watersheds. Then um, we said, well, we sh these shouldn't be places where we're managing for brown trout. So we lost quite a few sub watersheds that way and we took us down to 188 sub watersheds at that point. And then um, if a sub watershed had a high abundance of non-native salmonids, we uh, eliminated it as well. 
And then we reviewed the data with all of our biologists and for let them have the opportunity the best professional judgments given the data to make some revisions, as I call them mulligans. Uh, we, we looked at the results and then we ran the Brook Trout Reserves nominations through a second criteria. So we grouped the subwatersheds, we aggregated them, and we eliminated any reserve after they were aggregated that didn't have any Brook Trout contemporary surveys. If we weren't surveying them uh, anywhere in that reserve, um, they, got they were dropped. Then we split them back out, we disaggregated them and we looked at non-native trout and salmon and we said if, if non-native trout and salmon outnumber the brook trout, um, interspecific competition was so great it would limit our opportunities to, to uh, do much with them. And so we dropped those reserves, those sub watersheds, and then we that had that situation and in this map they're shown as stippled. Those were, were interspecific competition was great. Some of the subwatersheds of the Driftless, um, some of the North uh, South Shore Lake Superior and Bayfield and Douglas counties. Um, and, and so those were eliminated. So in this map, now I'm showing you the statewide distribution of the, we have 54 candidate reserves. Um, don't worry about the legend or the color tones. I'll talk about them in my next portion of my presentation. Um, and we, oops, excuse me. We have, um, we've, we've, we've got a map book and a summary document of all this analysis where we're zooming in here. I'm showing you on just an example page on one um, area, the West Slope streams of the West Slope of the Red Cedar River. If you look, you can see the city of Menominee um, and the descriptive uh, data about which, uh, share with the reader the five subwatersheds that create this reserve and, and many of the conditions within the reserve. So we have, the, we have this set of places out there that we've nominated and, and, and they're going to respond differently. Um, and we really want to look at within each of these reserves now, our second objective was to assess some of the environmental and bio biological and climactic threats to the reserves because th th they're quite different. For this, I used cluster analysis it's, uh, to assess these threats. Um, there's 205 subwatersheds in the reserves and cluster analysis is a data mining exploration technique that groups subwatersheds that are more similar to each other relative to the other groups. And it's a common technique in statistical data analysis. And um, here I used cluster membership is based on the uh, eight standardized variables I'm showing um, in this data mining exercise. I used fishtail, uh, index characterizing stream fish response to urban and agricultural anthropogenic land use conditions. Uh, predicted mid-century July stream temperature uh, increases. How much is this July stream temp gonna increase? The percent of public land in the subwatershed uh, across the whole subwatershed from our DNR managed lands. The predicted mid-century July stream temperature, the absolute mean for July from fish fish, and the percent of trout stream within with a natural riparian 30 meter buffer from our Wistland 2 2016 data. So it's the condition of natural vegetation in the buffer. The percent of the trout stream adjacent to public land within that reserve. The percent of future brook trout habitat remaining, it's resilience of the brook trout populations in these reserves, and the total amount of habitat uh, predicted as well in the mid century. So, the first thing, how many groups or clusters do you have uh, you know, to work with? I used a separate analysis to look at what that optimal number is. And so, um, in, the, in this case, we, we chose seven clusters. So, we used eight variables to describe seven groups of uh, members. So I'm going to take some time and walk you through this cluster analysis. Um, and I'm going to see if I can describe it in a way because there's going to be, like I said, there's seven clusters. And so, so I'll try and 
show you this framework and the, spend a little more time on this first slide. So on the upper left, we've got the, the cluster label, the cluster number, and the number of sub-watersheds. So, so for cluster one, we have 43 sub-watersheds. And then I've included a few descriptor terms as well. Uh, and then um, the, the cluster one sub-watersheds in the map are here are highlighted in forest green, for example, across. And the left half of the slide then shows this cluster profile plot. Um, and this cluster profile plot contains the eight variables that were used in the analysis and this dashed vertical line represents the grand mean across all the data and all the clusters. Um, and then the, the, the variable mean within each cluster is marked by this dot and the horizontal line show the standard deviation for each of the variables. So this is the fishtail land use with a higher value being higher quality uh, watershed conditions, um, higher fishtail index. These, this, so I'm gonna walk you through this results for cluster one here. So cluster ones, um, cluster one watersheds present, possess excellent watershed health, a high percent of public land ownership relative to the other clusters. However, their streams show much less thermal resilience. They're gonna get warmer, change in stream temp and the future temps are very gonna be quite warm relative to other, other ones. Their riparian areas are, are, are in excellent condition. Um, Certainly there's a large proportion of these streams that have the riparian zone in public ownership, yet brook trout stream miles and future habitat is lower than expected. Um, and so cluster one is uh, predominantly in the Northeast part of the state. Um, and uh, there, that's where the many of them are. And these subwater sheds are naturally vulnerable and our adaptation strategies uh, may be more limited here. Um, for example, limited to remediating and removing barriers to fish move, movements to allow fish to move and remaining vigilant related to this watershed health and riparian zone. So I've called them healthy public sub watersheds with weak thermal resilience. Now I can move through some of the other clusters. Um, cluster two, uh, is uh, healthy subwatersheds with weak thermal resilience as well. Um, and they're outlined in white uh, boundaries around them. Unlike cluster one, these, these clusters don't have uh, ample amounts of public land or uh, in public ownership in the riparian and watershed is average um, to somewhat below average. Future stream temps are above average and thermal resilience is weak. Um, and these are these these subwatersheds are scattered across much of the northern lakes and forests. But the, the lack of public ownership in the riparian and uh, watersheds wide is the feature here. Cluster three is highlighted in cyan, cyan and it's again predominantly in the northern northern lakes and forest ecoregion. They have uh, excellent. Uh, subwatershed and buffer health, high public ownership. Um, future stream temps will remain co cooler here and their thermal resilience is quite a bit better. Um, and fish fish shows very high future brook trout habitat and species resilience in these subwatershed is excellent. And so these are some of our, um, you know, subwatersheds where Vigilant protection is probably a more appropriate management strategy. And again, they're mostly within the Northern Lakes and forests, but it's this high projection of down here, brook trout habitat that exists um, and with uh, fairly good resilience thermally as well in these systems. Cluster four is shown in white. They're kind of scattered across all of our um, three predominant ecoregions here. Um, they possess average conditions of subwatershed and riparian health and public ownership. And 
the, it really, there's an average habitat, um, but species resilience is, is, is fairly strong. It's predominant, prominent in uh, Bayfield County. We have several of them and it's scattered across the North Central Hardwoods and um, the, the, the uh, land use conditions are average. The future stream temps, they're gonna be cold. They're quite thermally resilient and they're average amounts of habitat for brook trout. Cluster five are, are really agricultural subwatersheds predominantly. Um, they have below average subwatershed health. Um, they're ag they have agriculturally impacted buffers. They have low public ownership in the riparian and in the subwatershed wide. Um, but they possess some abundant future brook trout habitat and excellent brook trout resilience as well. Cluster five is mainly located, you know, throughout the dripless ecoregion, um, and they represent a stronghold among some of our brook trout reserves be because of their thermal conditions. These subwatersheds, while overall fairly resilient, they offer a lot of adaptation opportunities to secure and, and hold the future brook trout in these and improve riparian habitat in these particular subwatersheds. There's there's a lot of potential for their management. Subwater six, six is uh, shown in orange here. I, I think I'm a little color deficient, but that, yeah, orange or rust. Um, they are below average in health, subwatershed wide, their land use impacts exist. Um, overall, the subwatershed ownership tends to be more privately held and, but there has a strong component of public riparian ownership for these. And there's some of our classic fishery areas are throughout many of these sub, sub watersheds. Um, cluster six predominates in the Northern Central Forest ecoregion and contains um, the systems like the Little Wolf, the Comet, Caves Creek, Lawrence Creek, Big Russia Cree. Um, these sub watersheds are vulnerable, but there are a lot of re rehabilitation opportunities to offset some of the impacts of climate change because of the amount of public land we own in the riparian zone. Uh, cluster seven is our last um, subwatershed characterization. Um, these are, again, they're, they're private lag subwatersheds. Um, despite their poor watershed health and riparian health, these stream systems will remain cooler and, than average, and they have consistently good thermal resilience. There's more private ownership throughout them and the more varied private ownership in the riparian zone. Um, future brought, trout habitat and species resilience is below average, but therefore cluster seven subwatersheds are vulnerable and there's a lot of rehabilitation opportunities to offset ongoing climate change impacts particularly the acquisition of riparian lands and land rights in the form of stream bank protection easements here. Now what I've done with this map is I tried to take that cluster analysis of these seven groups and further boil it down into some themes really about, you know, environmental resilience of these stream systems and what our strategies might be. So here I show these very dark green um, brook trout reserves is having the highest environmental resilience to the ongoing effects of climate change. The light green colored reserves are next resilient, but they contain opportunities really to secure, further secure and protect habitat. So the dark green are really, the, probably the operative term is vigilance and protection. And then the light green is more securing more habitat and doing things um, with, there's more opportunities to do more. The reserve shown in yellow contain some of the uh, uh, very excellent subwatershed and riparian health. They're, they're, they're high quality uh, reserves. However, they're really more limited in terms of their groundwater contributions and it makes them more naturally vulnerable. And so there are more limited opportunities to really set these are naturally vulnerable and that we don't have a lot of really tools to offset uh, the impacts of climate change here perhaps maintaining connectivity for uh, populations and fish communities to find uh, refugia is more important in the, in the tan areas. 
And then the um, the ones that are shown in orange are are more very vulnerable. Um, and here we have a lot of adaptation strategies we could consider um, as well when when we're working on the you know the vulnerable rehabilitation opportunity systems. So what we're doing for time. So when we start classifying these groups, I, for every reserve, we've, we've uh, created an environmental resilience score for that reserve. And we can think about the y-axis here of lots of different variables. Here I'm showing percent buffer in the public ownership and then environmental resilience. And we can begin to build some, here I'm talking about riparian management strategies. We can begin to build some themes here. I'm sorry. So we can build some themes here uh, around environmental resilience. Um, in the upper right panel, you have um, percent public ownership is high and they're the most re resilient systems we have. Um, and I'd say the theme is more vigilance of staying the course. Um, in the lower right, you have a protection theme where you have low public ownership, but you have high resilience. You can make some investments to um, really acquire more authority to protect that riparian area, whether it's conservation easements or acquisition. Um, and then in the middle, you have reasonable re resilience and um, high ownership. You, you already have authority here. You, you, you can manage the riparian areas. You, you've already got a lot or you acquire more. And then in the lower left, really, uh, these are the toughest challenge reserves. And um, if, if it's environmental resilience is really poor, you're, you could either be throwing in the towel for brown trout management or um, really putting together some more realistic goals. So you can begin to think about these things in terms of uh, thematics for um, work. Um, so we, the Brook Trout Reserves team was an internal team um, that the department had. Um, now the, the department leadership has authorized the Bureau of Fisheries Management to lead an effort to collaborate with our partners on objective three and implement conservation action. So we're working on a Brook Trout Reserves implementation planning that we're beginning now. Um, and it'll be a much more detailed place-based plan at a local level with specific strategies in each of the sub-watersheds within a reserve to address um, uh, some rehabilitation or remediation techniques or um, approaches for the individual reserve. In the, in the three-year, our three-year goal is to have the plan complete and implementation ongoing for many of the watersheds where we're dealing with riparian stream and spring pond conservation actions underway. And we'll re really be focusing on riparian reforestation as well and populating those treatments into the department's actions and working with managed forest law landowners, MFL landowners, et cetera. And, <coughs> excuse me, by five year, we plan on being in full implementation with the Brook Drop Reserves and, uh, and we will continue to monitor and uh, the status and trends. And as um, Brian Maitland said in the previous presentation, these are the good old days of uh, trout fishing. And uh, we, we wanna keep this, uh, this important species on the landscape and uh, we look forward to implementing this conservation proposal. Thank you very much, um, Paul. I'm gonna turn it back to you and, uh, and uh, I'll, uh, Leave it at that. Thanks, everyone. All right, we can look at your polls here, Paul. Uh, there were several polls in uh, the conference platform. If you're watching, you can take a look at those polls. You can click on the, the polls tab at the upper right of your screen to cast your vote. And uh, I will share my screen, Paul, and we'll take a look at some of those. Uh, before we get to those, while people are voting, we do have one question that came in right around the time that we transitioned to your talk, Paul. So I'm not sure if this was meant for Brian or for you, um, but it's asking, can you talk a bit about rising groundwater temperatures linked to ambient air temperature and whether this is included in the model projections? So, um, yeah, I can, I can 
attempt to tackle it. So the, the fish fizz model early on when the Wisconsin Initiative on Global Climate Change, the Wiki Working Group began, we had some simpler uh, stream flow and temperature models, um, but Steve Westenbrook, uh, Matt Mitro and Jana Stewart worked on a daily time step stream model that incorporated this daily precipitation aspect into the fish viz model. So um, there was some significant improvements in um, predicting base flow and stream temperatures in the, the revisions of the fish viz. So there, in my earlier modeling in the Driftless Area Master Plan, I didn't have as good of a stream temperature model. There's been um, a lot of improvements. Um, likewise, though, um, those are models and, you know, models aren't perfect. Um, they're, they're great thinking tools and we are undergoing this wet period where we've had all these elevated, particularly in southern Wisconsin, we have a lot of regionally elevated um, groundwater tables. We've got lakes that are joining and becoming much larger. We've got localized uh, groundwater flooding. Um, and so as Brian Maitland, uh, you know, showed that this has all been good for trout in the short run. What the long run holds um, may be quite different um, in terms of this wet period we're in now. Um, we may also have more, much more episodic frequent, frequent events of drought and other disturbances. So um, we're using the best science we have uh, in these projections and we're hoping to learn and be more accurate in our predictions in the future. If Brian, if you want to jump in, I know you're still here, so uh, feel free to unmute yourself. He's he's not still here. He I, he took off. So he took off. Okay. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for answering that question, Paul. Yeah. All right. I will pull up the polls, and we can take a look at those, and you can respond to those too. All right. Are you seeing them, Paul? Yes. Um, so I laid out a few questions in this poll and uh, I'll, I'll um, Paul, why don't you summarize it? But what I was looking at is as we roll out these place-based planning efforts for the Brook Trout Reserves, the planning efforts, we'll be thinking about what are the techniques and tools for um, adaptation strategies for, for Brook Trout Reserves. Um, and there's no single action that's going to keep brook trout on the landscape. It's going to be a, a series of different things statewide. And I wanted to capture some of our audience's thoughts. So take it away. What do you see, Paul? Yeah, so we did have 52 responses. Uh, we have we have 26 people in here. So you're, you're seeing the effect of people vote, uh, voting more than one time here. But it looks like reducing the impacts of fish barriers is, is the big one that everybody thought was was very beneficial for brook trout and then reforestation of stream riparian areas and agricultural BMPs. Um, Paul, do you wanna talk a little bit about what the impacts of fish barriers are to trout and other cold water species? So, you know, I ref uh, thanks Paul. I referenced some of that in when I was talking about the, the, uh, the uh, cluster up in Northeast Wisconsin where um, these streams, uh, that are more driven by surface runoff patterns and their contribution of deep and, uh, and groundwater sources is more limited. Um, we know that fish and, and trout will need to vacate um, areas. Some of these Matt Mitros have been learning that and describing, it's not just the summer, it's also the winter when you get um, these streams with low flows, you get ice anchoring almost to the stream bed and these streams uh, because of their low um, spring and groundwater sources are low they become very inhospitable in certain areas and these fish need to well they'll use them they need to vacate them at certain seasons and so we've got tag trout you know radio telemetry trout that move 50 60 70 miles sometimes on the Ocano is a good example where these fish need to move and we have this whole infrastructure of culverts, bridges, and dams that create barriers to these fish to be able to find refugia. 
um, because they need summer refugia. Um, as trout are a steno stenotherm, uh, given temperature, they're cooked, their goose is cooked. Um, and likewise, they need to find overwintering habitats. And so reducing this fragmentation is a key component to some of the reserves as well. Thanks, Paul. Let's move on to the next poll. Uh, looks like most of the people that voted on this one were anglers or recreationalists. And I'll go right to the last poll. So this, uh, this, let me just uh, suggest one thing. I think um, there was one, um, there was a couple groups in here that aren't even reflected in the response. So that's uh, informative as well as, you know, one of the aspects of this Brook Trout Reserves will be working with the agricultural community and uh, there's not a farmer in the audience. So we'll, we'll, we'll need to work hard to bring all of our partners and stakeholders in to make, make this make this process um, have buy-in and uh, contribution from all. So anyway, absolutely. just thought I'd point that out. All right, we do have 13 that said they are interested in participating and planning. And we had some email addresses come in as well. I'll just send you a list of those, Paul, the, the fourth poll question. Well, that would uh, be great. Yeah, instead and, of looking uh, at them here. I will follow up. And so when the department rolls out its uh, Brook Trout Reserves planning, we, we'll create through Gov delivery uh, distribution list and your, the participants in the poll that are interested will be added to that distribution list. list. We'll, we'll be reaching out to you. Okay, sounds good. We have one question in the Q&A for you, Paul. Uh, how long does it take to establish a trend in population for brook trout for a stream or huck, say to determine whether management strategies are working given nat uh, natural fluctuations in populations? Well, um, that's, a, that's a challenging question. I think it's not just time trend data within that hydrologic, our assessment won't be just time trend data in that hydrologic unit. We'll be doing more natural experiments against some other similar units that um, don't have that kind of management as well. So it'll, when we think about this, it'll be more of a before after control impact design rather than, but the long-term response might be, uh, our management might be looking at these populations when they go some real thematic stresses like localized droughts, um, some more extreme events as well. But I think the idea here is the, we'll be tracking these implementation tools through decades rather than years. Um, it, sometimes it, it takes decades to have uh, some real meaningful management as well on the landscape. Um, in terms of acquisition, in terms of um, conservation practices, uh, best management practices, everything from protecting groundwater from high cap wells or managing high cap wells to connectivity. So the it'll be dependent on the degree of management which we can collaborate on as well. But I think we're talking about decades here rather than years. Thanks, Paul. I think we'll we'll call it there. We have a break now until 945. So please check out the photo contest, the Water Week challenges and exhibitors, and we'll see you all back here for more fisheries and climate talks at 945.